Shalom and uh, welcome everyone to class. Thank you, Lailama and Jafina for class. John Paul, thank you for joining class. Uh, we'll begin a study of uh, Romans chapter 15. We already studied verses 1 and 2 on uh, uh, Friday. We'll continue studying the rest of this chapter uh, today. I'll ask uh, one of you to lead us in prayer, please. Anyone can lead us in prayer? Only one of you Father, we thank you for this uh, day you have given us as we come before you. We pray, God, that you would speak to each one of us, help us to know your word. We bless this time of learning. We ask for your grace to surround us. Um, give uh, Pastor Selena wisdom and understanding to share your word and help all of us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So we began our study of uh, Romans chapter 15. Uh, we uh, studied verses 1 and 2. Basically, in Romans chapter 15, uh, Paul is continuing uh, on what he had written in chapter 14 and how we have to bear with those who are weak. Basically, when we or when we are using the word weak as those who are new in the faith or those who are already in the faith and they are growing. And um, that's the first half of Romans chapter 15. In the second part of this chapter, uh, he cha shares his ministry plans and, you know, he uh, begins to wrap up uh, his letter that he um, is writing to the church at Rome. Okay, uh, so in verses 1 and 2, oh, we saw how he says we need to bear with the weak and not to please ourselves. And he says that each please his neighbor for his good, uh, leading to uh, edification. Okay, uh, we'll begin with uh, verse 3. So can one of you please read verse 3, please? For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Amen. So here, uh, the point he's basically making is, you know, um, he's telling uh, the believers, the mature believers, that, you know, those who are strong in their faith, basically he's saying how they need to bear with those who are weak. You know, and um, he says that they need to be of one mind, relate to one another in unity and oneness. Um, and even as they relate with uh, these kind of people who are new in their faith or growing in their faith, they need to be gentle and loving um, and show them from the word of God what they need to do, how they need to live, uh, how they need to conduct their lives and how God wants us to uh, live. Okay. And, uh, you know, um, he says that you need to love your neighbor. Okay. Verse 2 he says, you know, everyone has to please his neighbor. Why should we please our neighbor? What does he say in verse 2? Why should we please our neighbor? Yes, for their edification. Yes. And for their good. Okay, so that they can be edified and they can be good. Now, can we always, you know, love our neighbors and can we always be good to them? Can we always do things that can edify them? Is it humanly possible? It's challenging. It's difficult, you know. Um, but then uh, he's telling the, uh, you know, the the believers, or those who are strong in their faith. He's saying, you know, uh, he points an uh, He points out to them an example. In the example, who is the example he points out to? Jesus Christ. Yes, he says this is how Jesus Christ lived. Verse three. He says the very people he came to die were the very people who, you know, belittled him, uh, belittled him, sorry, belittled him and, you know, uh, you know, brought shame and disgrace and, you know, dishonored him. Uh, but what did Jesus do? He just quietly took everything. Okay. Uh, why did Jesus 
just quietly take on everything. And there's sometimes when he spoke to them, he, you know, he he told them what needs to be uh, told, uh, but in a very gentle, uh, compassionate. Uh, sometimes it was a little hard and firm with them as well, but speaking the truth in love, of course, you know. Um, but why do you think that you know Jesus did not retaliate? Um, you know, why didn't he get back, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth? Or, you know, why didn't he uh, then why, fight against them? Or, you know, why didn't he not get back? Why, what do you think? Because like Paul says, you know, uh, he's telling his people, these are all minor things, you know. Don't major on these minor things. You know, what kind of food to eat, what, you know, what day is more special than the other, and all of those things. And even if Jesus went through all of these things, he knew that it did not matter to him because it's going to be very temporary, right? He's not going to be here for everlasting amen. You know, he's going to go back to his father, but he's here for a specific reason, a specific purpose, that is to do the will of God. And he knew that along with fulfilling God's plan and purpose for why he came here on this earth, this was part of uh, that. And that is why Jesus says, you know, if you're, uh, you know, part of the kingdom of God, there will be persecution. He did, he did not, uh, there will be difficulties, there will be challenges. He did not promise, you know, a peaceful life, a life of prosperity and blessing. And, you know, where we just speak to our enemies, we speak to our mountains and, you know, everything is just removed and moved and there is victory. Of course, that is uh, what he has, uh, you know, purchased for us, that is our spiritual inheritance, but we need to uh, work that out in the natural, we need to speak uh, to our giants, to our mountains, to our enemies, uh, we need to, uh, you know, be militant like in our spirit at times, um, to take hold of the things that God has given to us. So we have to be aggressive and militant like in our spirit to fight against uh, the enemy. And it is a fight that we uh, fight, the good fight of, of faith, okay, as the word of God says. So he says, you know, uh, why didn't Jesus retaliate? Because all of these are temporary things. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, and it's, you know, um, uh, uh, temporary, he's just here to do uh, the work of the Father, and uh, 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 you know he's having that greater vision, the greater plan, and the purpose for which he has come. And it says, uh, "For even Christ did not please himself." Okay, so Jesus is the uh, ultimate example of one who did not please himself but put others first. And um, you know, uh, a classic. Uh, Development, development of this idea, which uh, Paul is mentioning here, is what he has written on in Philippians chapter two, uh, verses five to eleven, and uh, it's a very important uh, scripture, uh, something that we read uh, most often during uh, the Christmas season. Philippians chapter two, verses uh, five to eleven. Uh, can one of you read that, please? Let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider the robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So uh, I think it's the NIV, it says, in your relationship with, Paul begins like this in verse 5, in your relationship with one another, one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider it equality with uh, God. So we see that, you know, um, 
Paul is here giving us an example of uh, Jesus who did not come to please himself and you know set us an example on how we need to relate with one another uh, having the same mindset that is in Christ Jesus who being God did not consider it equality with God and you know did not uh, and made himself as nothing and he took on the nature of a servant came in human likeness you know he humbled himself even being obedient to the death on the uh, cross and that is how we need to uh, be that is the example that we need to follow and he says in here in verse 3 but as it is written okay so as jesus took abuse and suffered wrong for god's glory he was basically fulfilling what was written in god's word what was prophesied what was spoken before about him so jesus showed us by his own life example that you know uh, for most part we are entirely you know uh, very quick uh, to vindicate ourselves most often instead of letting god vindicate uh, us and um, you know jesus showed us how the father is able well able actually well able uh, to vindicate us yes there are times when we need to take those steps you know but also most often we need to just uh, you know uh, let god vindicate us uh, just like jesus did and follow his example and he says the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me okay uh, this commandment jesus fulfilled which was written uh, in Psalms chapter 69, verse 7. Now, you know, how does it apply to us in our present day context? You know, it says in this verse that uh, it was written, you know, which means this is written for our learning uh, that we might have hope, uh, uh, knowing that, you know, even when we do things that are right, when it is difficult, when it's challenging, you know, we have the hope. So everything that is written in scripture, you know, all of these life examples of uh, the Old Testament characters, all of these are not just there in the Bible uh, because, you know, it had to be there. But all of this is actually speaking to us, ministering to us, uh, teaching us, um, and helping us learn how we need to live our lives uh, so that we might have hope and also for us to know that when we do what is righteous in God's eyes even when it's difficult there is hope God vindicates us and God will see us through okay we'll move on to verse uh, 4 can one of you please read verse 4 please Anyone can read verse 4? For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. Amen. So it says, whatever things were written in the past, in the Old Testament, you know, uh, uh, were written for our learning. Uh, in this context, it's the Old Testament because the New Testament was not yet in print like we have the Old and New, but for us, it's both the Old and New. Okay, So whatever things were written in the past in the Old Testament were written for our learning. So Paul is telling the church, it's written for our learning so that we can learn from uh, scripture and he's going to point out uh, to us uh, you know uh, what are those few scriptures he's going to point out those verses to us uh, and he says even as we look at these scriptures you know that is written for us you know we receive comfort and patience through these scriptures so for us when you look at both old and new testament we learn from various uh, characters in the bible from various uh, all of the writings of paul all of the experiences what jesus thought and everything you know we receive comfort and patience through uh, scripture 
okay uh, and there is uh, an ability you know to have endurance patience and comfort strength uh, consolation and encouragement um, that can be brought into our lives even as we read scripture even as we meditate and dwell on scripture and even as we look at various people who have journeyed through life um, as it is written for us about their life journey in scripture okay um, so when we look at uh, Old Testament characters and how they journey with God, uh, you know, through their lives, we receive or we learn, you know, perseverance, ability to endure, we receive comfort, strength, uh, encouragement, consolation, and we have this hope or uh, the ability to look forward uh, with expectation, with hope uh, that, you know, what we are going through now, you know, is just momentary, that there is hope in the future, that God will see us through, God will bring about deliverance, God will make things beautiful, He will redeem things in our life, and, you know, um, He's a God of breakthroughs. Okay, so that is what is uh, verse uh, four. So some of us, you know, believe only in the New Testament. Uh, uh, you know, being part of the church today, most some of them just read the New Testament. They think the Old Testament is not needed, but you know, um, we need to uh, see Scripture its entire whole, old and new, and both old and new. You know, uh, teach us because what is written in the new uh, is a fulfillment of what is written in the old. So we need to have the forward and backward look, even when we are studying uh, scripture. Just enhances our whole, uh, 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 enhances the truth and brings alive the truth and helps us to interpret the truth in uh, context. Uh, even as we look at the truth in one verse, we need to look at it the entirety of Scripture, what Scripture is talking about, the whole truth about this verse uh, uh, in the entire sense of this, we can come to a place where we are misinterpreting uh, Scripture and uh, it can lead to false doctrines and misunderstanding of God's Word. So we need the entire uh, Scripture, Old and New Testament. Okay, we'll move on to verses uh, five to verse uh, uh, five to verse seven. Uh, before that, anyone has any questions? Anything that you'd like to say about verses one to four? Okay, if uh, there's no queries, no comments, we'll move on. Uh, can somebody please read verses 5 to verse 7, please? Verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So he begins um, verse 5, he says, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 5 says, Now may the God of patience and comfort. Now may the God. So he says the fact that you know, Paul puts these words uh, into the form of a prayer, you know, demonstrates that, you know, he's actually recognizing that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that must be done inside us, okay? So for us to not retaliate uh, and to be like Jesus, for us to, you know, uh, be patient with others, for us to please our neighbors and um, not to please ourselves, you know, he says, you know, this is only possible uh, through uh, the work of the Holy Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit that is done inside us. And he says, the God of patience. Our God is a God who is patient uh, with us. He's a God of patience. You know, uh, often we are in such a hurry and, uh, you know, uh, and God often seems to sometimes work too slowly for us you know, uh, and we lose out on our patience with God as well. Um, often, you know, we 
we think uh, the purposes of God or we assume or we seem to think that the purposes of God are delayed, uh, you know, but even if God takes his own time to do things beautifully in his own time, you know, he always fulfills what he has planned and his purpose for us and the promises that he has spoken over our uh, lives. So we know that God's delays, uh, where we see it as delays, it's not delay on God's part, but we see it as delay or we see God as being slow, uh, it's not actually his denials. Um, he has a purpose for each one of us. His purpose is loving. His loving purpose is for each one of us. And he's never um, uh, delayed in doing what he does. He always does it on time. But if there is a delay, there is nothing wrong on God's part. The problem is always with us, right? Um, so the delay is from our part when we have not done what God wants us or we are not positioned ourselves in the right place, the right time, doing the right thing that God wants us to be doing. Okay. Uh, you know, we often love God's patience because he's very patient with us when we pray or when we, when we look at our own lives and say, God, thank you for being so patient, you know, with us. Uh, he's so patient with uh, his people. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we need him to be patient with us, you know. Uh, sometimes we can also say, God, can you please be patient with me? You know, I'm struggling in this area. God, please be patient. Thank you that you're a God of patience and I can expect you to be patient. You know, uh, we need God to be patient with us. Uh, but, you know, um, often um, we uh, we... We are not patient when God does not respond to us uh, with his plan, with his purposes, his answers to our prayer. Or, you know, we are not patient about why he is not fulfilling certain things in our uh, life. And we think that God should hurry up. You know, uh, you know, he's being so delayed on what he's doing in this area of my life. We think like that, you know. Um, but whatever our circumstances, wherever we find ourselves, you know, God is patient both with his people and with his uh, plan and fulfilling his plan and purpose for our um, lives. Okay. So he says here that uh, in, in verse 5, you know, um, oh, sorry, verse 6, that you may with one mind uh, and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that you may. So the goal here, you know, uh, of uh, uh, the goal here is basically to glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we accomplish that goal? He says we accomplish this goal by having one mind and one mouth, which means one mind and one mouth means by being united in the way we think and we speak. Okay, in our thinking, you know, not judging others, condemning others in our speech, not condemning and putting down others, judge, being judging about others, telling them what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. But, you know, um, uh, being one in uh, mind and mouth, and when we, that is one in our thinking and speech, it says when we are one uh, in that, in these areas, you know, we glorify God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, so verse six, um, you know, uh, uh, basically, what if we do what Paul has been instructing us in Romans chapter 14 and in Romans chapter 15, verses one and two? Uh, he says, We can be of one mind and one mouth, glorifying the Lord together. So he says, Whatever you uh, you know, if you follow my instructions that I've given in Romans, if what I've written previously in my letter, you know, the previous paragraphs for us, it's in, in chapter and verse in, in chapter 14. And, uh, you know, the beginning of chapter 15, 1 and 2, he says, when you follow those instructions, you can be of one mind and one mouth. When you do that, you will be glorifying, you, or we will be glorifying the Lord together as a church. Okay. So in verses 5, 6, and 7, the Apostle Paul, you know, he basically wants the believers to be like-minded, of, of one mouth, means one voice. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is so important because as believers, we try our best to be like-minded and, you know, having one voice, we can glorify God. 
okay and uh, is this possible and easy in today's world on the church today being of one mind and one voice is it difficult yes it is difficult yes it is difficult uh, for god's people to be like this um, but it is something that we need to all pursue um, uh, you know to do to maintain the unity of the uh, spirit like uh, paul has already mentioned in chapter 14 where he says you know don't let the non essential things divide us you know don't judge another brother regarding the, the food he eats his observance of certain days but be patient build each other um, up okay so uh, when we are working towards being like-minded, being one wo one mind, one voice, that we can glorify uh, God together, sadly, you know, these non-essential things become so big in our uh, in our lives, in the church, among believers, that people are arguing, fighting, and they even get uh, divided. So, uh, you know, instead of fighting and arguing and getting divided on these things, you know, uh, let us please and edify uh, one another so that, you know, we can be of one mind and one voice and glorify God. Okay. Verse 7, he says, receive one another just as Christ also has received us. So it says when we meet believers who are different from us, you know, uh, instead of allowing those differences to divide us, um, Paul is basically saying, you know, receive them as believers, as brothers, sisters in the faith. Be welcoming, be kind, um, just receiving and embracing them just like Christ has received us and welcomed us and embraced us and loved us. Okay. Um, so I think we can begin to do this and we can try to do this with other believers, uh, you know, who may not believe everything we do, who come from different denominations, different, uh, you know, doc they have different doctrines, different styles of worship, different ways of worship, uh, different patterns, uh, thought processes, you know, even though they come from different denominations, you know, let's... Um, uh, come, uh, you know, to a place where we can actually love them, believe, uh, you know, just uh, uh, receive them, welcome them, because even though they are from different denominations, you know, we uh, uh, we should come together. Is it possible to, for us to come together in unity even if they are from different denominations? What do you all think? Yes, no? Is it, is it uh, possible for us to come together even if... We are from different denominations. Can we have some answers in the chat? You can just write yes, no. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Zelatoli. Jabina yes. says yes. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, why do you think we can come together even though our doctrines, styles of worship are different, liturgies are different? You know, what can bring us together? Okay, Jafina says the love of Christ, yes. Very good. But I still have a doubt, like, uh, some people, they don't, like, in some denominations, even they don't consider Christ, like, uh, when we go to this uh, Roman Catholics. So, it, it, I think it might be hard for us to be together in, in their part, because uh, their doctrine is totally wrong in some ways I think that may cause so much damage in the unity yeah so when we talk about coming together as uh, believers we're talking in the context of believers in terms of uh, you know those who are believing the Father Son and the Holy Spirit only yeah so uh, Rosalind says, yes, we can come together because of our faith in Jesus as the Son of God. So we are coming together not on the grounds of doctrine, but we're coming on uh, together on the basis of our faith. That is our foundation. Okay. So what is the basis of our faith? We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What, is, what else is the basis of our faith?
we believe in the very good, the, the cross of Christ, uh, the death, the uh, resurrection, ex ascension, the seated of Christ, the right hand of God the Father. Yes, we are all cleansed by one blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. We all have, uh, there's only one Holy Spirit that we believe in. There's um, one scripture, the word of God, the Bible that we have. So these are all common basis, foundation for our uh, faith. And on this foundation, you know, people have built up their own doctrine. So we can, yes, come together on the basis of our uh, faith. And all of these are the foundations, are the important foundations of our um, faith. And that we are one body in Christ. And even though we are different parts, and who is the head? Christ. Christ is the head. We have one head. And we all belong to the same kingdom. Okay, we are all sons and daughters of the same, uh, 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 of one father, and we belong to the kingdom of uh, God. Okay, so these are some of the things that is the foundations of our faith. And so we all, can, we all agree on this. So we can all uh, come together, you know, um, and join hands, partner, and together in unity and uh, in oneness so that we can you know, bring about city transformation and together as a citywide church, as a body of Christ, all the local churches coming together, we can transform our city. This is some of the things that we studied, if you remember, in Kingdom Builders, the book Kingdom Builders. Okay, So, uh, uh, you know, verse 7 says we need to, hence we need to receive and accommodate um, one another. Okay. Uh, verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us, the glory of God, therefore receive one and other. Okay? And uh, he says, uh, above all of these things, you know, uh, you know, we need to, re yes, receive and accommodate one another. But when we receive and accommodate one another, does it mean that we do not correct each other or we overlook sin or we don't address sin? We do, right? Um, yes, we address sin, we do correct sin, but we do it lovingly uh, because Paul has already written to us that the, the goodness of God leads to repentance, that God himself, you know, ha uh, foreknews who are vessels of wrath and vessels for, uh, of, uh, for glory, you know, and those were vessels of judgment. And he says he's going to bring the wrath upon them, but he is... Uh, long suffering. He is patient with them, not wanting anyone to uh, perish. Okay. So, yes, in the same way, we need to be patient, long suffering, uh, you know, uh, let the goodness of God uh, the, through our lives lead them to repentance. But uh, uh, we do correct people. Uh, we do lovingly call out sin as sin. And we do all this in a way that honors God and His word. Okay. So any questions on verses 5 to verse 7? Okay, if not, we'll move on to verses uh, 8 to 13. Can somebody read verses 8 to 13, please? I'll read. Romans chapter 15 verses 8 to 13. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, rejoice O Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. L loud him, all your people. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jephina. In verses 8 to 13, uh, Paul points, uh, uh, you know, to the Old Testament scriptures, quoting a lot of Old Testament scripture here. Uh, he says, even though God was, uh, and through these Old Testament scriptures, he's saying that even though God was working through uh, the Jewish people, uh, through them, 
you know, through the Jews, there was so much that was spoken of that the Gentiles would be blessed. So even though God was working, his plans and purposes were for the Jews, uh, but even through those Jewish people, you know, so much was spoken uh, uh, for the Gentiles, uh, that the Gentiles would also be blessed. So in verse 9, Paul is quoting from Psalm 18, uh, verse uh, 49, where he says, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. In verse 10, he's uh, quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, um, Rejoice of Gentiles with his people. And in verse 11, he's quoting from Psalm 117, verse 1, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, Lord him, all you peoples. And verse 12, uh, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and uh, verse 10. So basically all these scriptures are saying that the Gentiles will praise God and they will give glory uh, to God. So uh, even there or even in these scripture passages, you know, we learn that while God was working with the Jews, he was giving them the promises, it was all being done so that the Gentiles would also glorify God. So this is what God has been working towards, not just for the Jews, but also that the Gentiles will glorify um, God. So, you know, Paul is reminding us here once again that he's a God of both the Jews and the Gentiles, and his promises that were spoken uh, towards the Jews was ultimately also to bless the uh, Gentiles. So verse 13, you know, is almost like a benediction. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, verse 5, he says, uh, may the God of patience and comfort, and here he says, the God of hope, you know, uh, he says there, God of patience, fill us with endurance. Here he says, God of comfort, fill us uh, with, you know, uh, he says, may the God of... Uh, Sorry, one minute. Verse 13. Can somebody read verse 13, please, for us? We didn't read that. Or did we read that? Okay. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy um, Spirit. Okay. So, there in verse 5, he says, God of patience, fill us with endurance. You know, here he says in verse uh, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and um, peace. So, you know, he says, God of comfort means God of uh, strength, God of consolation. You know, may this God of comfort fill us with uh, and he says, now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing uh, that, you know, we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy um, Spirit. Okay. So when we, you know, believe in hope, you know, with all joy and peace, you know, uh, we can abound in hope and, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit will be manifested in our lives. Okay, so in these verses, you know, uh, till verse um, 13, uh, Paul has basically been talking about um, uh, the believers. Uh, he's been instructing the believers on how they should, uh, you know, uh, live towards others, how they should uh, re relate with others. Now in verses 14 onwards, he speaks about his, uh, his plans, his travel plans. Uh, so we'll read about that in verses 14 to verse 21. Any questions so far till verse uh, 13? Anyone has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, can somebody please read verses 14 to 21, please? Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more 
boldly to you on some points, as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God that so that from Jerusalem and round about to uh, Illyricum, I have fully preached uh, the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Amen. Thank you. So in verses 20, 14 to 21, he is, Paul is basically shifting his whole thought uh, to sharing some of his personal thoughts. And then he goes on to speak about his personal plans. Uh, so verse 14, uh, he's confident that, you know, the believers at Rome are full of goodness, full of knowledge. They're able to admonish one another. And hence he's asking them to be, you know, there to encourage, motivate, um, inspire each other to do the things that he has spoken or he has admonished or he has asked them to do uh, so far in the letter that he has written to uh, them. Okay. And then, you know, in verses uh, uh, 15 to verse uh, 21, you know, uh, you know, post basically the things that he's already stated, you know, uh, Paul is saying that it would be challenging for some of their thinking, uh, you know, especially on how they uh, relate to each other and how they treat and serve each other. But Paul says, you know, I've been bold in telling you, uh, you know, all of these things. And I have told you, even though, you know, you might question my authority, I have not established the church there, I have not visited you, I have not uh, imparted into your lives, I have not uh, taught you and all of those, those things. You might think that I don't have any right, but he's saying I have the boldness in telling you because I know the grace of God over my life. So he's saying this boldness is coming not because, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, the uh, I uh, you know I have the authority because I'm your spiritual father, or you know I have um, led you to Christ, or I have uh, built up the church at Rome, or I've you know come there, imparted, and taught to you. No, uh, he knows that he's not done any of these things, but he's saying he has the boldness in telling them because he knows the grace of God over his um, life. So what do we learn from this? You know. Uh, when we know the grace of God over our life or in our life, we can move boldly in this um, grace, you know, or we can operate powerfully or boldly in the grace uh, of God uh, over our life or in our life. It does not mean that, you know, we can be arrogant, proud, or think that, um, you know, uh, we are better than others. It means that, you know, when we serve God or we're called to serve God in a certain area, we have a certain function that God has given to us. You know, when we know the grace of God uh, in that area, you know, uh, we can move boldly in that grace. Um, we can operate powerfully and boldly in that uh, grace. We can serve people boldly and, uh, you know, uh, whatever area of function that God has called us to, whether it's the ministry of the word or praying for people or whatever, you know, we can be powerful and bold in the grace that God has given uh, to us. And what is the grace of uh, God that was given to Paul? He talks about this in verses 16 onwards. He says that the grace of God has made him a minister to the, to the, Gentiles, yes. And he says he can minister the gospel of God um, to the Gentiles. Uh, and he says that even as he does this, you know, he uh, it is uh, the, the gospel is brought with great 
power because it is the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in and uh, through him. And he says, because he has the grace of God over his life, you know, to minister the gospel, uh, he says, therefore, he can speak boldly about the things of God um, that ha God has worked in and through uh, him. And he can speak about what God has spoken uh, through him. Okay, then he begins to talk about how God has brought the Gentiles to faith in Christ Jesus through faith and through deeds, that is through signs, miracles and wonders. And he says, you know, because the grace of God that is over his life, he can fully preach the gospel uh, from Jerusalem to Ilkrim, you know, Ilkrim, uh, Ilkrim is the modern day Albania. Uh, and, uh, you know, he says that he has proclaimed the gospel from Jerusalem to Ilikrim through the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. And he says he has been able to do this because of the grace of God that was given to uh, him. Okay. So uh, God's grace on Paul's life is to preach the gospel in the places where the gospel has not been preached uh, before you know, so that he can establish the work of God. So he's basically an apostle. So he's you know, preaching the gospel where the gospel has not been preached before and he can establish the work there. Uh, uh, and he says, you know, uh, because of the grace of God, he can preach the gospel where the gospel has not been preached. And he says, and uh, hence he does not have to build on someone else's uh, foundation. So Paul is describing the grace of God in his life and he says that whatever he's doing, he's doing it boldly because of the grace of God that is there in his life. And um, how does he know that? Because, you know, he has proved uh, it through his um, ministry and all the things that he has done. He's saying all the things that I've accomplished, all that he mentions about is because he says it's the grace of God over his life. Okay. Another thing we can learn is that as we move in the grace of God in our life, you know, um, uh, you're exercising it, you're practicing it in your living, uh, that that is your life your ministry you know the way you're living the way you're teaching the way you're preaching uh, you are basically proving the grace of god in your uh, life and we studied this when god calls us to a specific function in the body of christ you know he gives us the grace you know grace is the divine enablement the divine character the divine uh, favor he enables us you know gives us the divine favor the divine enablement the divine character that we need to fulfill the function that he has uh, given us so he gives us the grace and the gifts that we need to fulfill the function that he has uh, called us to so you know when we uh, exercise practice uh, uh, you know, uh, God's calling and we fulfill it, we live it out, you know, uh, we do go about doing our ministry. All of this is basically proving the grace of God over our um, lives. And when you prove the grace of God over your life and when you show people to your ministry uh, and you're proving the grace of God that is functional in and through you, you know, he says you can move boldly. Okay. So in Paul's case, uh, the grace of God was to minister the gospel to the Gentiles uh, from Jerusalem to Ilicrim uh, very boldly, unashamed, unashamedly, uh, with signs, miracles, and wonders, and basically to bring the Gentiles in this area to the obedience uh, to Jesus Christ and to establish the work there, uh, which was not done before. There was no work done, but he had established God's work there and led the Gentiles to the faith, to the obedience uh, uh, to Christ Jesus. And, um, uh, you know, and he says that he's, uh, he has pioneered, pioneered the ministry here in these places, you know, uh, and he has not worked on uh, other people's foundation, but he has done what, uh, you know, God has called him uh, to do. So he says that he's speaking of things that Christ has established in his own um, life. So 
two things, you know, know the grace of God in your life by proving it, by showing it uh, through the way you live, through your ministry, the way you're uh, exercising it, the way you're practicing, uh, living it in your own life. And secondly, you know, when you know the grace of God over your life, you can move in it very, very boldly. Okay, so this is what he's talking about in uh, these verses, um, you know, uh, verses 15 to verse 21. He's talking about the grace of God over his life and what the grace of God has accomplished him to do. And uh, because of this, you know, he can boldly speak and write and admonish and uh, tell other believers how they need to live their lives, how they need to fulfill their calling and their function that God has given to them. And then in verses 22 to verse 33, he talks about or shares about his travel plans. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So even as we end class here, you know, God has called us to specific functions, know your function and what uh, the grace of God over your life is, you know, and live out that grace. Uh, even as you fulfill God's function, the grace of God is operative, his gifts are operative. And even as you go about doing the ministry and living and exercising and practicing uh, it through your life, you would, uh, you know, uh, uh, show the grace of God that is over your life and people can see it. And also, uh, you know, you can also move boldly uh, because of uh, the grace of God that is over your lives. Okay, we'll stop here. Um, uh, I will post the last assessment, assessment four uh, tomorrow. Is that fine? Okay, and I'll give you a week's time to do the last assessment. So maybe you can, you know, post it, uh, uh, submit it, sorry, uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay, and I think we'll finish class uh, by Friday. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class and uh, see you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Rosalind.